Today is homecoming. What does that mean, Brother Sam? Well, traditionally, in churches, when we have homecoming, it is generally a celebration of the anniversary of the church's uh, work of ministry in a community. This year, we celebrate our 45th year as an established church. It's also a time for reflection, not only on the past. That's what homecoming's about, isn't it? Seeing old faces of folks that worship with you and seeing old friends and seeing people and reminiscing of the past years and what God had accomplished. But it's not only about reminiscing of the past, but it is looking toward the future. And that's what I want to talk about today, is I want us to look at the future. I've entitled this sermon, Where Do We Go From Here? Where do we go from here? Uh, sometimes we're bad about living in the past. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, isn't it the natural response of humans to always reminisce and to think about past? Especially if you have a failure, what do you have a tendency to remember? The failures of the past instead of looking toward the future. I love what Dr. Tony Evans says about that. He says if you're constantly living in the past, you have no hope for a future. And many times that's what churches do. We reminisce and we reflect on the years of old, the years that have gone by, the past accomplishments, the past works of our God. And today I want us to look at where do we go from here? Uh, what's going to happen to Woodhaven Baptist Church in 10 years from now? Where, where we're going to be 15 years from now. Some of you sitting here today and you're saying, Brother Sam, I don't know that I've got 15 years. Exactly. We need to look at the future. None of us are assured. I may not be here 15 minutes from now. But we need to look at the future and not get stuck in the past. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to a unique passage found in 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7. Uh, we call it 2 Kings because it comes after 1 Kings. And that way you don't get lost to find 1 Kings and just keep flipping. 2 Kings chapter 7. Now for our guest, uh, God spoke to my heart several months ago about a word. It's called receive. The scripture taught us that the word receive means to, to take hold of by the hand. It means to acquire something and pull it into your life. The scripture says that we are to receive the word with joy, with meekness, with happiness. And so God instructed our church, instructed me as a pastor, each week to have the people extend their hands and say, God, we're here today to receive a word from you, just as the word said. So we want to invite you to do that with us this morning. If you're here to hear a word from God and receive a word from God, would you just extend your hands up toward the heavens and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you grateful for the word of God. We, we are grateful for the truth found in God. And Father, we are grateful that you've given us a word today. And Father, we are extending our hands as a symbol of our willingness to receive the word, to take hold of this word today. And greater than that, Father, let the word take hold of us. May it transform us. May it change us. May it bring that which is lost into salvation. May it uh, bring that which is captive into freedom. May it do a great work in our lives today. The scripture says that the word would not come back void, that it will accomplish the purpose and task by which God has given it. So, Father, you use this word today to inspire to encourage, to instruct, and even rebuke us is our prayer now in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Kings chapter 7, would you stand with me if you're physically able for the reading of God's word, beginning in verse number 3. Now, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die. If we say we enter the city, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. 
Now, now, therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to the surprise, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left their camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you grateful for this word and ask now that you do amazing things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. In our text today, I believe the Lord has given us the picture of what the modern church needs to do more of, and that is to examine our lives and where we are. In our text, the nation of Israel, the king of Israel, has come to Samaria. And while he is there, he has been uh, surrounded by the Syrians, and they have, uh, they have seized the city. And while they are seizing the city, famine comes. Y'all know what a famine is? A famine is where there's no food. There's no substance. And so outside of the gate sit four men, who examine what's going on, and they begin to make decisions for their lives. I said earlier today that I want our church to, uh, to look at the future. I believe that these four men give us an example of what God wants us to do each and every week, not just at homecoming, but each and every week, each and every day of our lives. I only got two points today. Look at your neighbor and say, praise God. Just two. It's all. We're going to eat in a few minutes. Y'all all right? <laughs> no. Just two points. First of all, I want you to notice that the men evaluated their personal lives. Did you look at verse number three? Look what the verse says. The Bible says, Now there were four leprous men in the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? These four men had leprosy. That means under the nation of Israel and their laws, they were unclean. They were unapproachable. They did not mingle. They did not fit in with the community. Matter of fact, if you had leprosy, you were dependent, listen to this, to the generosity of the community by which you live. If they wanted to be grateful, uh, giving towards you, they'd give you food, they would give you money, they would give you medical attention. You were dependent totally on those around you and their generosity. And so these four men were sitting outside the gate because they could not go into the city. They were contagious. If you could touch someone with leprosy, you could catch leprosy. That is a flesh-eating disease. And so they were outcast, and they weren't in the city. And these four men begin to look at their lives. They begin to examine their lives, and they ask themselves, what are we going to do? Are we just going to sit here and die? One of the greatest fears that I have as a pastor and as a man of God is allowing spiritual dryness, listen, to creep in and cause spiritual death. Has anybody ever had spiritual famine? If you ever went through a season to where uh, the Spirit of God didn't seem as powerful or as, as, as important as he once did in your life? Have you ever had a season in your life to where your prayer life just kind of got dry? Have you ever had a season that your, that your service just kind of went to the wayside? Have you ever had a season of spiritual famine in your life? Spiritual dryness leads to spiritual death. According to chapter 6, verse 24, the scripture says that famine had entered the city. 
Uh, it says, and it happened after this that Ben Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his armies and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head, listen, a donkey's head, was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a nab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. The chapter concludes with a woman coming to the king and saying, I need your help. There was a neighbor who said, if I will give my son up for dinner, she'll give her son up the next day for dinner. They were actually literally eating the children. The famine was so great. The need was so great. As I began to read that, I said, Lord, can I enter, can the children of God enter into a place of spiritual famine, famine that we would do something as, as sickening as eat our own children? Well, we may not do it physically, but ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you, when you have spiritual drought, when I have spiritual drought, it affects the, the spiritual condition of our children and our grandchildren. Hmm. I want to leave a legacy for my grandson. I want my son and my daughters. My daughters are here today. My son's not, but my daughters are here today. I want them to say of their daddy that he was a man of God. I want them to be challenged to live a life with God just as I lived, and I want them to carry that challenge to their children, which will carry it to their children, which will carry it to their children. Look at America today. We are losing generations of children because of the failure and the spiritual famine of the generations before. I look back at the men that influenced me. All these great men of God are dying. They come from the Jesus movement. You know that movement in the 60s where the hippies started getting saved? And we had a great spiritual awakening in America. I don't know if you understand that and know that. But they called it the Jesus movement. And people started getting saved in the late 70s and, and the early 70s and, uh, and all the way into the 80s. And, and I got saved under the ministry of people that didn't know any better than to just live for Jesus Christ. Men that preach the truth, that live the truth, that challenge God's people to be a holy people, to be separated from the world. That generation has now gone away. The generation left is this one. That's trying to leave it to his children so that their children will be a godly country and a godly people. Well, if you look at where we are now, we're in trouble. Somebody has dropped the ball. I wonder if we're sitting outside the gates here in America saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Do we just sit here and die? I hear Christians all the time saying the enemy's gaining ground. The enemy's winning. No, he's not. He's only doing that when we fail to walk with Christ, to live for Christ, to walk in the spiritual bounty of the Spirit of God. And the power of our God. Great churches are made of great people. It's what the scripture says. The Bible says that we're individuals. According to Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says that we are now the body of Christ. And members individually. Behind every great ministry. Behind every great church. Is not a great pastor. It's not a great staff. It is great people. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to challenge and look at our lives individually and ask the question, are we sitting at the gate and just waiting for death? Now, I can say that because we're all getting older together, aren't we? As Miss Susan was in the choir and she came by and she said, this is really 45 years. It doesn't seem like it. She was a charter member here. That means she was here from the conception of it. And you begin to look and you think, wait a minute, it doesn't seem like it's that many years. I don't believe it's been that many years. But it has been. How many great men and women have come through the doors of our fellowship and now gone on to be with Jesus in glory that leave behind a wonderful... I was thinking about Miss Helen this morning as I was preparing to get ready for church. 
how she went home to be with Jesus. And I miss Miss Helen. I miss her picking on me. Look at Miss Ruby in the hospital, Miss Dot in retirement. And I look and see those beautiful faces and think, my, how they have touched my life and how they've impacted my life and, and how they were part of those days here, those early days here, faithful and committed to stay. When everybody else said, shut the door, they said, no, we believe God's going to do something. And they stuck it out, waiting on God to do something. Behind every awesome ministry is awesome people. And the Bible says, according once again to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that if a man judge himself, he shall not be judged. James says that our evaluation of our spiritual life should be daily. It should, matter of fact, he equates it to looking into a mirror. He says, what man will look into a mirror and see himself and not be changed? So in our story today, God points out four individuals and God says, I want you to notice these four individuals before they started passing judgment, before they began to evaluate their situ the situation of the city, they began with themselves. What choice are we going to make? Are we just going to sit here and die? Or are we going to make a decision to do something? I'm going to ask you, and then I, I, we got senior adults. If you're a senior adult, I love you. You know that. But by no means is God finished with you. Are you just going to sit and wait for death? I mean, death is coming quick enough. Don't sit and wait on it. <laughs> Old Satchel Page said, don't look back. Something might be gaining on you. <laughs> Sitting at the gate waiting on death, it may be gaining on you. And by the way, if I'm going to die, I just soon die serving our Lord than sitting and waiting. Anybody can sit and wait. Where's your spiritual life? What's your spiritual condition? When's the last time the Spirit of God really just shook your life down to the, down to the foundation? And when's the last time God looked and spoke to you and spoke such a word to you that your heart leaped, either for joy or... Well, it should be joy even if he brings conviction of something. When's the last time that God just rattled you spiritually? When's the last time you felt the awesome holy presence of a holy God? Sitting on my porch this morning, drinking coffee, praising the Lord and praying. And I said, God, I really want to challenge the people today, but I want to challenge me first. You've always heard me say this, I want to finish well. It'd be a shame to start off out of the gate and do good the first section, do good the second section, and then in the third and the fourth begin to fade. I don't want to be an afterthought. I don't want somebody to say he didn't finish well. So when I'm preparing this message, I say, God, begin with me. Begin with the man of God. God, I want to be challenged. Where's my life spiritually? Am I done yet? No, I've got lots of years left. Y'all know the plan I'm on. I'm on the retirement plan with Moses. I want to have my vitality all the way until God says take him home. <laughs> Kenneth Bird was a man that I really loved. Brother Kenneth Bird was a, a pup wooder. Brother Kenneth, when he reached out to grab your hand, you better be ready because when he shook, he shook like a man, forms like a tree. I mean, he picked up that put wood and put it on the truck. Y'all all right? Did that his whole life. When he was in ministry, he kept working on his little farm. And I, I used, to, used to hang out with Brother Kenna. I love Brother Kenna. I love old preachers. Amen. They just, they rubbed off on me. And Brother Kenna just be so strong and vibrant. Brother Kenna passed on when he was 80s. And at his funeral, I remember the man that preached his funeral said, he's as strong at the end as he was in the beginning. And that impacted me. I was like, man, that's what I want somebody to say about me. I want somebody to say, man, the fire that Brother Sam had when God saved him and God called him to the ministry and God placed him in church and God let him pastor a church, all that fire and energy never went away. That it was the same. I don't want to sit at the gate and just say, what do we do? Die. What about you? 
Are you willing to evaluate your spiritual life today? Is it dry? Is there a famine? You know the difference. You know when you're walking with God, the fire, the energy, the passion, the control, the influence that God has upon your life. You know the difference. You know what it means for God to set your heart afire in service and dedication. You know the difference in spiritual vitality and dryness. You say, I'm somewhere in the middle. We call that plateaus. Watch this. You're either climbing, leveled off, or declining. I'm kind of on cruise. We call that plateaued. Let me tell you what I know about plateau. When you get on a plateau, if you're going to get off, you either go to the high country or you go to the low country. Let me say that again. When you're on a plateau, you either go to the high country or you go to the low country. But that's one thing certain. If you stay on the plateau, you'll die. Where are we today? I'm afraid we may have many that are sitting at the gate saying, we're just going to die. Verse 4, you see these four men after they evaluate their own spiritual lives, then they begin to evaluate the circumstances or the city and what's going on in the city, what they say. said, <clears throat> Say, if we say we entered the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. If we see here, we die also. Now, therefore, let us come and surrender to the arm of the Assyrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall only die. They came to a place individually that they had to look collectively at their surroundings, and they had to evaluate those things. Not only do we need to evaluate our lives personally, we need to evaluate our lives collectively as a church, as the body of Christ. Do we have evidence that God evaluates churches? The Bible says that let judgment begin where? The house of God. In the book of Revelations, in the third and fourth chapter, are they not dedicated to God judging and evaluating seven churches and seven types of churches? So churches will be judged by our God. The Scripture mandates that each body be evaluated. Healthy churches evaluate their surroundings and must make decisions and choices that will impact their futures. Let me say that again. A church needs to evaluate its surroundings, its community, its time. I was telling Brother Ross a little earlier that uh, God is really stirring my heart about several different things, and as God reveals those things, I'm going to reveal them to you. <clears throat> but, but here's one thing that God says. You need to look around and acknowledge that things aren't the same as they were 20 years ago. People aren't the same. I mean, my goodness, you know how hard it is to keep somebody's attention who's walking around with the phone in their hand all the time? Just to get their attention. Absolutely right. How, do you, how does a church reach people when people are so disconnected with people? I can probably reach more people by just sending a text out. Having a blog. I don't even know what that is. It sounds... you know what God said, even though you don't know what those things are, you might need to broaden who you are. Churches need to broaden who we are. Do we keep the things of tradition that work? Absolutely. But if they're not working, why do we stay stuck in them? Why do we demand that we keep the plateau? Y'all right. Y'all looking at me mean now. I don't why do we want to keep things and do things that are no longer benefiting the body of Christ? That's not growing and reaching people, sharing with people, 
Can churches determine to just sit at the gate and die? Yeah. Refusing change. I was telling Brother Ross, because he's not been here the whole time, uh, and he's the rookie on the staff, but one of the great things about this congregation is if God leads me to do something, you folks just follow. It's not been a whole, it's not been a struggle, and it's not been division, and it's not been, now listen, we may make this, some decision that, that sometimes personally you don't agree with, amen? I mean, you may not like a, a certain decision that's made, or, but, but you know what, for the most part, people just go with whatever God says to do. And I think that's one of the things that God has used to honor and bless this congregation and keep it alive. Never forget, folks, if you're new to our congregation, you don't realize this. This was a church that, the, that folks in the community said Ichabod was written on. It had gotten down to about 12, 16 people had trouble finding pastors. 16 people stuck together and said, God's going, our God will resurrect it. And he has. And one of the great tools that God has used here is harmony. By the way, that's how you know that God's in the middle of it because when God's in the middle of it, there ought not be discord and there ought not be division within the body. There shouldn't be any. If God's in it and, and God's directing it and the people just want to be where God is and they want to experience God and they want God to do something, then who are we to stand in the way of that God just because I don't like it? I don't know about you, but God's never asked me my opinion about something he told me to do. <laughs> never has said, hey, Sam, what do you think? 30 years of ministry, I've never heard that in my prayer time. I'd like to have your evaluation, Sam, of what our plan is. He's never asked. By the way, he'll never ask. Because it's his will that matters. It is his purpose that he will accomplish. It is his plan that will be fulfilled. And it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I like. It doesn't matter if I even agree with it. I love these four men. Did you see them four men? They said, we're really running out of options. If we stay here, we die. If we go in there, we die. If we go to the Syrians, they're probably going to kill us. Not only are we lepers, but we're Israeli lepers. <laughs> so we're the enemy. So, I mean, we've got three choices, and all three bring the same consequence. Death. I also noticed here that nowhere did these lepers inquire of God. Did you notice that? There wasn't a prayer meeting. There wasn't a consultation with the, with the staff or the deacons or any of that kind of stuff. They just said, look, here's our, here's our, here's our self-evaluation of our circumstance and situation. We're surrounded with death, and there's only one way to, to get out of this thing is death. There's a small chance that if we go to the Syrians, they'll let us live. Maybe they'll have mercy on us. Maybe. Might. Probably a 60-40 chance. Yet, did you notice that God already had the plan? He was just waiting on somebody to make a move. God had already worked before they ever got there. They had not knowledge of what God was doing or what God intended to do. They evaluated themselves personally. Then they evaluated their surroundings and circumstances. And they said, here's the one thing we know. We're not just going to sit here. We're going to have some faith that God's going to do something. Don't know what it is. Don't know what the outcome's going to be. Not even sure. But I know this. If we stay here, I know what the outcome is. Certain death. So they got up and made their way to the camp. Now, if you can read on. I'm not up there. I don't need to be. I've read it and studied it. If you read, here's what happens. God has a stir in the camp. God scares off the Syrians and leaves the whole camp intact. Horses donkeys. You read on, it says their tents, their food. The lepers get there and they've got a fine breakfast cooked because they left before twilight. Eggs. They didn't have no bacon they would use. Well, I... <laughs> Wait a minute, the Syrians could have had hog because they were Gentiles. So let's give them some hog, amen? Had bacon and sausage. 
hash browns. Had all that cooking, getting ready to go to war and to, and, to, and to fight the Israelis. And God stirred them up and they fled because they were afraid of God. If you read chapter 5 and chapter 6, that's not the first time God had already struck the Syrians. He's already done a few things and they recognized that God of the nation of Israel was really who he said he was. And so when they said the armies, the nation of Israel's inquired armies and they're going to destroy us, let's just leave everything. They didn't get their packs. They didn't get their clothes. They didn't get their wealth. They left everything. And these four lepers come in and said, look uh, here. Man. Now, keep reading the story. I know I'm not reading the scripture. I'm paraphrasing the second time. Here's what they did. They come in there and they started eating and they felt bad about what they were doing. They said, here we are. We were outside the gate and so many people inside that gate were generous to us. So many people inside that gate took care of us when we couldn't take care of us. They showed us mercy. They showed us grace. They showed us compassion. It's a picture of what Jesus Christ does in us. We were outside the gate of heaven, diseased by sin. Jesus destroyed the army, gave us the right to come in and take all the riches and spoils. Mm. But he didn't intend for them to just keep them to ourselves. They felt under such conviction. They said, wait a minute, all them folks have been merciful to us and kind to us and compassionate to us and caring to us. They took care of us in our hour of need. Now we've got all these spoils and we're not going to be selfish. We're going to take them back and give them hope. Give them life. Share what God has done for me with them. They go back and give it all. To the city. Now, folks, that's a picture of what Jesus has done for the church. Everybody in this room right here, if you're saved and born again, you were a leper. You didn't qualify. You didn't, nothing you could do. You were diseased, uncurable disease, by the way. You were in great need. Famine was in your life. You were in despair and discouragement, hopeless. Matter of fact, you had a death sentence. Certain death. And God defeated the enemy of sin. Said, now come to the camp. But did you notice, don't they have to leave the gate of the city to go to the camp? See, you can sit here today. I can sit here today and ignore where we are as a church. Can I just say it? I'm going to say it. We're plateaued. We're plateaued. We've been on plateau now for a couple of years. Y'all right? And if you look around you this morning, if we'd be honest, we've started a decline. Well, what are you going to do? I'm hoping that we got enough that want to leave certain death and go forward with Jesus and get off the plateau and start the upward climb. That's what I'm banking on. By the way, we've plateaued here before, haven't we, church? We've leveled off before. And each time, the dip has just been a little bit, and God's got us right back up moving forward. I know at homecoming, y'all want to hear somebody different. I do, too. But God wouldn't let anybody come this year. I was reading in Psalms the other day, and the Bible says, for a shepherd know the condition of the flock so he can minister the herd. Who better to put us in a place to evaluate our position than the pastor? I'm telling you, we plateaued. And usually when the church plateaus, here, Brother Sam, I love you, I'm just being honest. Here, Brother Sam, usually when the church plateaus, because the people's plateaued. We spiritually got content, dry. Just kind of put on cruise a little bit. Just making it through this season, making it into that season. Y'all all right, I knew I wasn't going to get many amens, but I'm going to share the truth with you. So here we are, we're a church that has a 45-year history. 
And the Lord has done so many marvelous things. When the world counted us down and out, when the world said God had left this place, God said, not in your life. And he breathed in new life. There's so many ministries and so many things that God's done over the last 22 years. We've had preachers called out of here. We've had preachers restored in here. We've got so many ministries and so many things. You know what the community says about us now? We're a caring congregation. We're a congregation that cares for our community and for the people in it. You know who created that? It wasn't me. It wasn't you. It wasn't Pete. It's not Ross. The testimony... And the honor that our Lord Jesus receives for what he has done in this congregation has been through the individual lives of everybody sitting here today. Now, my question is, where do we go from here? Are we just going to sit back and say, well, glory be. Brother Gary, and I've not told him this, but Brother Gary's really challenging me here. And it, it, since he's retired, he's doing more in ministry now than he ever did in his life. It's supposed to be time that he sits back. He works at the jail. He's going to Cairo, Kairos. Uh, he's, anything I ask him to do, he does. Uh, our church needs done, he does. I mean, he's got so many things going on. He ain't got time to die. <laughs> that heart thing wasn't a deal, brother. God just gave you a new, new plumbing so you can keep going the next 15, 20 years. And I look at him and I say, Lord, that's why I, I don't want to slow down. Let's pick it up. Let's start getting after it. What else do you want us to do? Where do we go from here? By the way, we can only go where God, listen to me, look at me. We can only go where God takes us as a group if you begin individually. We're letting God take you where he wants to take you. Some of y'all, he's trying to prepare to be a Sunday school teacher or to work with children's church or work in the nursery. Some of y'all ought to be up here singing, playing instruments. Some of you have got great gifts and talents that the Lord's waiting for you to use, and, and, and you know what? You're sitting at a gate dying. Just waiting on the rapture. Well, that hurts the body. That keeps the body for fulfilling everything that God has for it. Last thing, and I, I promise I'll do. God just keeps my God took me to Moses. I love Moses. Moses wandered with a people that wanted to die for 40 years in the desert until those that didn't want to die got their blessing and went to the promised land. And then poor old Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. Well, that promised land, he did go into God's promised land. Y'all all right? He got a better promise out of the deal. I mean, he spent his entire ministry ministering to complaining, headstrong, stiff neck, rebellious, defiant people until God killed them all. Then God said, your ministry's over. Then old Joshua steps in. He gets to go into the promised land. He gets to see God give the promise and keep the promise. Oh, Joshua got the benefit. The way I look at my ministry here at Woodhaven is they was 23 years before me. They got me ready to go into the promised land. This has been a blessing. I hope that you don't hear the wrong thing today. This ministry, I don't, we never had the problems that traditional Baptist churches had in this church. We've never had the arguments and fights. There's been sweet unity and harmony here. That's how I know God's been in control. I mean, son, it's just as sweet as can be. There's never, do we always agree on everything? Uh Uh-uh, but I'll tell you what, when the Spirit of God's in control, you can agree to disagree and do it in love. You don't even understand it. You're like, I want to fight with them, but you really can't fight with them. Like, I disagree with them. Well, that's okay, you can disagree, but... We've got to stay in harmony and unity with God. Now, here, Brother Sam, here's the challenge. God's brought me today. The reason I'm preaching today is because God wants the church to hear the word. Not that somebody else couldn't have done it, but God said. I'm going to speak through him. 
he gave me this message, and I said, Lord, this is a tough message. I love those folks. I don't want to stand up and say all these things, God. Man, these people I'm growing old together with. And we're growing up together, aren't we? You've watched my kids grown and get married and have kids. We're growing old together. Nobody wants to say these things to people they love. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says if you love somebody, you'll rebuke them. That a rebuke is better than kind words. So God's sending us a word of rebuke today. We've plateaued and we've started the wrong way on the plateau. Are you listening, church? We're starting the wrong way on the plateau. How far are we? We ain't far yet. Y'all right? We ain't far yet. We got to pull up. Well, where's that pulling up again? Every individual sitting in the church right now. It begins with you. You got to evaluate you. Are you spiritually in famine? Dry? You start with you. And if God changes you, guess what he'll change? The whole body. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you grateful now for the words that you've spoken, for the message that you've given. I pray that everyone has received the word from you today. Father, I know there's times in my life that I've been spiritually dry. Famine has entered my life. As Brother Johnny says, my walk with Jesus is just commonplace. My prayers are just common. My service is just common. That's a sign of plateau. That's a sign of spiritual dryness, famine. The great thing about you, God, is that we can come to you and confess our sins. Repent of our sins, and, Father, you'll bring riches. You will bring spiritual growth and development. Those four lepers were blessed beyond measure. You didn't just meet their need in that moment. You met it for the rest of their lives. So, Father, I love that you bring conviction upon us because you want us to change. So my prayer right now is that everyone sitting here that received the word of God, Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, Father, may they come today and accept you as Lord and Savior. May they receive the mercy and grace that you provide while they sit at the gate and die. And, Father, there's many here today that have already received you. But, Father, if we're in a place of spiritual dryness, I pray that the Spirit of God brings such conviction upon our heart that, Father, we'll be like those lepers and say, I don't care who sees me. I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm leaving the gate and going with God. So now you speak and change lives. May we forever be changed is our prayer in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. As Sharon begins to play this morning, if you need to make a decision for Christ, maybe you're here today and you need to give your life to Christ. You're spiritually dead. Maybe you're here today and you're a child of God, but you're spiritually dry. Our staff will be here, Brother Ross, Brother Gary, Brother Pete, myself. We'll pray with you, give you instruction, encouragement. This altar be opened if God's spoken to you and you're dry. You'd be like the lepers and just come and say, God, I, I need your bounty. I need your blessing. I need your spirit to move into my life now and give me new life. Would you come?